Good afternoon. Welcome to Research Town Hall, focusing on the ramp up efforts at the University of Virginia. I am Ram Ramasubramanian, Vice President for Research, and I will be hosting this event. Um, Liz and I will be making opening remarks, and I will talk about the ramp up process for about 20 minutes. Then we plan to answer questions. We have received nearly 60 questions already from the research community. We will try to answer some of them at the end of the presentation. We have enabled the Q&A feature in Zoom for this town hall. You should be able to submit your questions uh, through that, as well as ask research at virginia.edu, and we will address them after the event. This event is being recorded and will be available on our website soon. Two months ago into the COVID-19 pandemic, we are beginning to look at ramping up on our on-ground research. The return to research laboratories will be phased, deliberate, and guided by public health advisories and will require detailed pre-return planning on the part of everyone involved. Our overarching goal is to protect and support our community, both by minimizing the risk and extent of viral infections and by finding safe and creative ways to reintroduce research previously put on hold. Our provost, Liz McGill, has been able to join us today. Liz has been working around the clock with the president, senior leaders, including vice presidents and the deans, the fall 2020 committee and our staff members to manage the COVID-19 crisis. Liz and I have been closely working on the research ramp up plan and her input from the broader institutional context has been extremely valuable in shaping this plan. The input of the deans and the associate deans of research and schools have been extremely helpful as well. I now invite Liz to address this town hall and kick this off. Sorry about that. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Ram. It's uh, it's great to be here today. I hope everyone is is safe and healthy in this uh, challenging and difficult time. I'm going to make really brief remarks so there's adequate time uh, to walk through the ramp up plans and also for the Q&A portion of this town hall event. I do want to start by saying I have a very deeply held belief in our research mission as a university. I think it's a, a core and essential part of our mission. I suspect if you are here today, you already agree with me. Um, so let me preach to the choir. Um, I believe that the production of knowledge and its dissemination uh, well, first of all, it's what gets me up in the morning. And I think it's uh, has long been and will be long into the future responsible for extraordinary advances in the human condition and the health of this planet. And I think this crisis, this pandemic has only deepened the need for great discovery and research. Uh, so I hope I'm among uh, fellow advocates of that today. And I, I don't doubt that at all. And I know Ram is a champion. Uh, I think uh, the belief in this mission of research was actually a driving force in me um, uh, saying yes to coming to UVA and being able to work with all of you and Ram and the deans and Dr. Kent um, to facilitate and support the research that you are doing. If you'll pit, permit me a brief aside uh, about Ram Ramasubramanian, he's been a leading voice in this institution and across our AAU peers. Uh, when it comes to planning and responding to this crisis. His thorough and his thoughtful approach has been quite central to our own planning and also uh, he's been a leader nationwide. So if I haven't said it enough, I wanna say thank you, Ram, uh, for everything you've done uh, both as a national leader and as a leader at UVA. 
So the past eight weeks have been incredibly challenging on so many dimensions and in particular uh, for many, although not all, I think of our researchers, um, challenging for everyone, but um, this COVID crisis has in particular disrupted the research efforts of, of many of our researchers. Uh, I try to think about what it would have meant to me as a faculty member uh, when I spent my time doing research, which was mostly archival uh, and use of databases. If someone told me with 24 hours notice that I had to flatten the curve and really impede uh, my research and those research assistants who were helping me. I would have been devastated and I expect all of you who faced that have been devastated as well. So at the while we have been working very hard on research continuity um, and advancing and continuing our research mission along with our teaching and our clinical mission, of course, we've had a commitment to protecting the health of our students, faculty, staff, researchers and our Charlottesville neighbors. Um, and the commitment to flattening the curve is what uh, led us to where we were and um, now that we're trying to uh, ramp up out of. For many of you, I know uh, our plans uh, about ramping down the research enterprise uh, really became somewhat difficult um, with the on-grounds labs and the use of graduate students um, in those labs. Um, I interacted and Ram interacted with many of you and actually many of your PhD students one-on-one uh, -on -one, uh, to find the right path forward to both recognize the, the, their own commitment to research, the role that they played in your labs in doing your research and also recognizing that first and foremost, they are our students um, and our obligation is to educate them. So moving forward, um, we need all your help. Um, Ram has already gotten a lot of your help. We're thinking about how to resume operations, more than thinking about it, have quite detailed plans um, that Ram is gonna share with you. Um, and then we'll, we'll try to take the questions you have and after the webinar, uh, continue to answer those questions in the coming days. So let me turn it back to you, Ram, with thanks for allowing me to be here uh, and uh, to be with you all today. Thank you, Liz, um, and um, your, your support and uh, participation is extremely crucial. And as the Chief Academic Officer, uh, uh, truly your, 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 your support and wisdom uh, is helping us uh, get through this. Thank you. Uh, with that, uh, I'm going to share my screen and, uh, and then go through uh, briefly uh, our plan. So let me go through the screen too. Share. <clears throat> Okay, our goal is to ramp up UVA's research activities in a timely, safe, and sustainable manner. So as I go through the presentation, you will see that we have paid attention to all these three uh, factors. Uh, we will be discussing on-grounds research ramp up, um, especially the laboratory and studio-based research. Additional guidelines for field-based research and off-grounds research that depend on travel regulations, availability of archives, as Liz mentioned, and access to remote sites and their policies will be discussed in a ramp-up document that will be shared with you uh, shortly after uh, this, uh, uh, this town hall. <clears throat> so let me discuss, um, as we went through this planning, uh, we had to establish uh, a, a guiding principle as to what are we trying to do uh, here and how. And uh, our, the, the first and foremost is only research activities requiring physical presence on grounds should take place on grounds. All other activities should continue to be carried out remotely through telework. That is our current university directive and consistent with the stay at home order. The uh, second is critical and key research will be ramped up first. This is consistent with the governor's executive order that is in effect right now, uh, expires June 10th. Uh, that in effect allows for critical research. So we can go ahead and plan for this ramp up under those guidelines. So uh, we have to be mindful of what research are we trying to ramp up. <clears throat> Ramping up will occur in phases. So let me explain what these phases are. Phase one is key research continuance under stay at home order, which is currently happening. So in other words, we are in phase one um, and uh, where designated faculty and staff continue to work on key research in labs under social distancing uh, requirements. Now in, under this phase one, 
in preparation for uh, moving on to phase two, which is where we want to get to, uh, the VPR office uh, continues to build business process infrastructure, secure supplies that we need, working with operations uh, team, assist schools and uh, work with them in developing a ramp up approval process that is specific to the schools. Every school is different, every discipline is different. So we have to make sure that your needs are met at the, at the level of uh, your school and integrating all that information across the schools. So moving uh, to phase two, where we are uh, aiming to go next is a low density laboratory and research workspace occupancy on grounds. This is achieved through a school level approval process and monitoring. <clears throat> Um, the graduate students may be included in this phase. Uh, densities and specifications uh, will be discussed uh, in this ramp up guidance document that I said uh, will be going up on, uh, on the website. So those are the details that uh, we will share with you uh, through the document. The phase three is medium density. There's ramping up density provided there are no new infections, et cetera. That will be consistent with the university policy as to what the next moving to the next stage will be. And phase four is normalcy, which I think is uh, the future. So what I have shown highlighted in blue is the topic of our discussion today. What are the activities that we are doing in preparation we're going to phase two and how are we going to get to phase two and how we are all going to work together in, the, in, in achieving that. So, uh, so uh, how should we move to phase two? So uh, in order to do that, we should establish first clearly what the safety guidelines are establish a ramp up request approval process. So if we ask uh, a lab uh, a researcher uh, with uh, a bunch of graduate students, they should know what information is ne needed uh, that they should uh, put together and who approves it. The process should be in place. Uh, and once the process in, is in place and uh, you go back to the lab to work and what kind of compliance monitoring mechanisms we should have. So I'll explain all, all of these uh, topics. Then finally, we want to integrate uh, the approval and compliance data across schools. This is the back end work that we will do for contact tracing, for instance. So having all the information in one platform is important. Um, and <clears throat> let's talk about safety guidelines. The safety guidelines is, uh, is uh, primarily based on three principles that we know works in this case, in the case of this pandemic. The first is social distancing to meet low density occupancy requirements. The second is uh, personal hygiene, washing hands frequently. So the details will be how frequently should you, uh, should you wash uh, and uh, what are the cleaning uh, uh, requirements uh, in, in uh, before and after work, et cetera. The social distancing will be the uh, density specification that we will have in the document that will tell you the distancing that you need uh, the number of people per, uh, or, or uh, number of square feet per person uh, and uh, information of that sort. Then finally, uh, wearing face covering at all times is an important element. I can't emphasize this one enough. Uh, we are not only protecting ourselves by wearing uh, face covering, but uh, protecting also uh, others from us. Uh, most of you know uh, that a cough can reach as far as six meters and a sneeze can go as far as eight meters. And these droplets can be in the air for up to 10 minutes. So if you're in the lab um, or a research space that is not exclusive to you at all times, uh, which is most unlikely, wearing a face covering is required for safety of others, uh, even if uh, no one is there at the time of your work. <clears throat> now let's talk about the ramp up uh, request approval process. Um, so what we are envisioning is, and what we are uh, in the process of implementing is that, uh, I will explain the, the, what you need to prepare uh, just in a few, a few minutes. The PIs prepare a work plan for, for their lab uh, and that will be compliant with the safety guidelines. This may involve rearranging equipment, uh, you know, workstations, furniture, et cetera, uh, to meet these distancing guidelines. And that will determine how many people you can bring uh, into, into your lab. And again, this prioritization uh, of what work, which graduate student need to come in, if this is at the PI and the school level approval process. Then schools uh, will provide guidance on the information needed in this plan uh, and uh, in, in consideration of an app request that you will uh, uh, produce and uh, process uh, and will be processed uh, for approval. Uh, the plan will be reviewed and approved by the schools and then you are good to go. That's the, uh, that's the mechanism that we are thinking about. 
Okay. Uh, the compliance monitoring uh, piece um, is important. This is a partnership um, with, uh, uh, with all of you and all of us are in this together to bring up research in a, as I said earlier, in a timely, safe and sustainable manner. Now, the, I want to focus on this uh, sustainability. Sustainability depends on compliance. It is no good if we all walk in in two days, three people get infected and, there is, uh, and we have to go back to phase one or phase zero it is not uh, prudent. So all of this work, painstaking work that we as a community that we do and the part that you play is to make sure that what we do is, is going to be sustainable uh, going forward. Uh, so if you don't take these safety requirements seriously, uh, you not only jeopardize your research, but uh, also that of others and their, their, their personal safety. So uh, what we have a me mechanisms that we are uh, working on, monitoring personal health on a daily basis, self-reporting, uh, and wearing a face covering uh, at all times, and not coming to work uh, when you have symptoms uh, or part, uh, part of the compliance uh, process. So as, as PIs, what can you do? Uh, <clears throat> while we are working on the infrastructure, policies and procedures, uh, fine tuning all of this for a ramp up, uh, what can you do as a research leader or a PI? So here is a list of things. It's, it's, it's a lot of, lot of uh, information here, but just thinking as a PI myself, um, prioritize your, your projects so that your critical projects, remember we said critical projects are permitted uh, and critical projects, either by nature of your work, nature of the work, the timeliness of the work, uh, the academic needs of the graduate student, there are many criteria that you may use to say that I prioritize project A versus project B. And that should be ramped up first in your lab. Uh, identify personnel that are connected to these uh, critical projects and, uh, and then uh, that includes graduate students. Uh, review the safety guidelines that uh, must be satisfied, including spatial density, distancing, um, uh, et cetera, that uh, you will see the details. Um, evaluate if the available space in your lab will accommodate uh, the personnel that you identify in, in the uh, step number two uh, that, and meet all distancing density safety guidelines. Uh, if necessary, reconfigure your space, and if possible, in some cases, if you had a gigantic heavy optical bench occupying significant part of the room, you can't. But in some cases, yes, you can. So think about those options. That's one of the options available in your design of ramp up, uh, given the safety guidelines that you, uh, you should follow. Uh, develop a sketch of how your laboratory workspace will be configured and how people will uh, work uh, in, in that space, meeting the requirements. Uh, if necessary, consider using shifts uh, and prepare a schedule for each member uh, and share with uh, on a common platform so people don't accidentally uh, uh, come in. And we will be talking about the entry process, et cetera. In fact, going back to uh, our, our guiding principle, the researchers that need to be in the lab on grounds should be prioritized. And not only that, uh, it is not that a graduate student having a project needs to be in the lab, so he or she is in. Instead, please look at the number of hours they need to be in to come in, work, collect the data and leave. That way you can increase your throughput. So it's not just saying three students, let them come in. Uh, but if you really restrict it, to, if they need four hours today, four hours Wednesday, then you can have additional students. So really plan uh, thoughtfully uh, to make sure that people are there only to, uh, on the need to be there to collect information, working on the projects hands-on, uh, that, that can be helpful. And Going past that, develop your lab policy for enforcing uh, the distancing guidelines, uh, wearing facial covering at all times, uh, hand sanitizing policies. If you, if you your lab uh, coming in, you have to you know, wash your hands with soap and then you finish your work and you clean these surfaces, et cetera. This is very specific to a lab if PI is in, the, in well positioned to make those uh, policies and make sure that your lab uh, uh, you know, occupants understand and follow. It is uh, essentially it's your responsibility that your lab personnel understand and comply with the policies so that uh, we can continue to make progress towards even more densification phase three. So the success of uh, the initial phase is critical. <clears throat> and finally, 
as you do this, uh, when you uh, ensure that uh, you have all the cleaning supplies you need, if not flag that to your department or school, I'll talk about the logistics of uh, supplies in just a second. Um, so um, in all of this, your commitment is, is absolutely essential. The success of this ramp up depends on each researcher placing safety of themselves and the people around them first while conducting their research. In order to reduce risks, this must be a partnership and compliance is essential. We have complete trust, Liz and I have complete trust that all of us will work together responsibly during this ramp up. And we sure uh, hope that we do not have to resort to very strong punitive measures that uh, to ensure compliance like other institutions have done, uh, revoking lab access, et cetera, for uh, non-compliance. We have very high expectations of ourselves and uh, I, I'm, I'm sure you will uh, come through. So the million dollar question, when can we go to phase one? Fa I mean, phase one to phase two, that is the interface we're talking about. So let me address it head on here. So the answer is you're gonna be disappointed. I'm not gonna pull out a date and mark it on the calendar, but I wanna assure you that this depends on, we have really thought through and we know exactly the set of things that need to happen and we are working feverishly to accomplish that. Okay, so please have that uh, confidence in us. So the dependencies are first an application process for ramp up requests. Um, and that is uh, the schools uh, we have discussed many, many times and the schools are developing the process. Now, once they have a process, there's gotta be a business way of automating. It's not paper stapled together, drawing stapled together, et cetera, but just enough automation that we can actually do. We believe that we don't want the perfect be the enemy of the good. So we really want to do it just enough that we can get going with this, right? Acquisition of adequate supplies. Now this is thanks to, uh, you, you know, um, JJ uh, uh, Davis, uh, you know, Colette uh, uh, and John De Silva and others that are working with our EHS. They're really coordinating what's the estimated number of faculty members that would come in, students would come in, what, how many uh, PPEs, where this is like in the case of masks, how much sanitizer is needed, et cetera, and centrally, bring those and what are the logistics of distribution uh, is something that's being worked on. So we need to get that right, get that in place. And uh, our EHS is also developing a 10 minute video so that all of these safety, uh, uh, safety uh, recommendations, guidelines uh, will be uh, walked through in that. And you will be able to uh, essentially go through the training, your lab members, and then uh, like any other uh, training, uh, you know, compliance training that we have, uh, you're asked a question and then you, uh, once you say um, you met those requirements, then you are ready to go into the lab subject to approval by the schools. Uh, we will feed that information to the schools and then that's one piece of information they will take into consideration. So um, in this context, we are asking the research community to help us in staging this recovery effort. And most immediately we would like the PIs uh, to think about planning uh, and planning on how they're going to be working with, uh, with uh, their lab and uh, structuring uh, the, uh, the comeback. Uh, we are centrally ordering supplies and using systems uh, we have in place to create tracking, uh, self-attestation, health status, uh, and training, uh, and others. Uh, all of these are happening at the same, uh, same time. So more details in uh, coming days on uh, research ramp up to phase two. And uh, I, I, I want to thank you. Uh, um, and uh, now Liz and I will answer some of the questions. The, let me go over to the questions page uh, <clears throat> here. So I'm, let me come out of the slide uh, screen. So I'm going to stop sharing. OK, so now let me look at the questions. Uh, the first question is when and under what conditions can we bring and work with students, graduate and undergraduate, postdocs and technical staff in our lab and in our offices? Um, so I'm gonna take a shot at this and then uh, Liz uh, can, um, can chime in. So we're working to create a process as I described to apply uh, to bring your lab and personnel, including graduate students back on grounds uh, in a safe uh, and careful manner. Of course, uh, the lab uh, staff, postdocs are, are all included. <clears throat> and um, the, uh, 
But uh, as far as undergraduates are concerned, I think uh, uh, we have uh, decided that that's not uh, something that we should do at, on phase one. That's, uh, that's, the, that's uh, uh, our feeling here. And that is subject to fall 2020 committee talking about undergraduates. So that's not the purview of uh, uh, research uh, at, this, at this point. Um, so other than that, as long as the processes are done uh, correctly, your graduate students, postdoc, and other staff uh, can come in. And uh, undergraduates, um, again, it, it's, it's a broader question that uh, Liz may want to address. Liz? I agree with everything you said. We, we could go on to the next question. OK. Uh, the next question is, uh, uh, with the hiring freeze, it's not possible to uh, complete uh, proposed research activities um, as proposed. Uh, can these policies be modified to allow to hire fully funded uh, sponsored, award, uh, sponsored awards? I, I know there is a process uh, for doing this. Liz, would you like to um, expand on that? Sure. So the, the basic line is that uh, the, a staff hire is, the, is actually in the purview of the dean and the dean's office. Um, so if you have approval of a staff hire, and I would think I mean, schools will make these decisions themselves, but if you have fully funded uh, individual, I've seen some of those waivers go through. Um, uh, request to hire a faculty member um, routes through the Dean to the provost office. And we are entertaining those uh, exceptions to the hiring freeze and have granted um, some with searches that were in progress and have promising uh, candidates where we wanna make an offer. So that's the simple answer. Thank you, Liz. <clears throat> So uh, this is a question on um, field uh, research. Like I said, this, uh, we are focused on um, on-grounds uh, research uh, so far. So this question is many uni university researchers conduct their work at field stations where the conditions are remote and it's outdoor. Uh, the considerations regarding best safe practices uh, will be different than on-grounds. Uh, working at field stations is also seasonal. Uh, so what is the policy? That's the question. Uh, so uh, the, uh, my first cut response uh, is uh, absolutely we do understand uh, field-based uh, uh, research. Now field-based research depends not only on on-grounds policy, but also the field station policies. If it's a public school uh, or, a, or a shared laboratory for, uh, for particle physics, there are policies that exist. So we have to be uh, in your uh, ramp up process, having to go there. Also the travel uh, comes into play. Uh, restriction, uh, travel restriction uh, should be lifted for you to do field-based work. So putting it all together, uh, the uh, field-based research uh, uh, should be coordinated with uh, on-grounds um, guidelines, as well as the guidelines of your, your uh, field stations. So as long as you can meet both of those, uh, I think, and then the travel restrictions are lifted, you're able to go. Uh, I think uh, that's uh, one aspect of this uh, for consideration. Again, the schools are developing uh, the uh, specific policies. I'm just giving you the highlights of, uh, we did discuss and we do have this in the document, this is the level, and then you have a deeper dive uh, that guidance that will be uh, from the schools that could be uh, discipline uh, specific. Uh, and anything to add on that, Liz? Okay. Um, is there going to be a, a planned staggering schedule to limit the number of individuals in a lab at a particular time? And um, so to this, for a lab, this is a crucial element of a PI planning for ramp up. Uh, this is going to require the use of uh, space uh, in your lab, making lists, et cetera, the process that I uh, uh, described. So you can, uh, you can use a staggering schedule. The answer is yes. Uh, if, if that will allow your throughput and the safe uh, execution of your critical projects, yes, uh, by all means, uh, think about that. And I know that there are a couple other questions that came about saying that if we stagger the schedule, please ask more than one person to be in the lab for safety reasons. So don't allow just one person coming at midnight to work alone. Uh, type of thing. That again, I think is a, the, the, the PI that wrote to me is very thoughtful and I'm sure in, in, in his lab, he's not gonna allow that to happen because that's gonna be part of the, the policy that he put forward in the planning that uh, in the scheduling, to, it's not gonna be one person scheduled to be alone in the lab 
at midnight, uh, that's not going to happen. I think the PIs have full con uh, control over how they stagger the work. Of course, there's building uh, uh, restrictions that might be there. That is something you have to coordinate with the schools who manages uh, the access, uh, building access uh, there. Okay. Um, let's see. <clears throat> Is there going to be a, a regular mandatory checkups on serological testing available? Okay. Uh, it is uh, the, the, the short answer is we don't have uh, a large scale serological testing available, but in our current plans, um, just as the health system is doing, uh, we are using self attestation as a mechanism of, uh, for your current health. Uh, we do not plan to do a physical uh, you know, a testing uh, of individuals uh, and, uh, and, uh, and due to privacy issues, we're not going to ask you those details. But, as, but this is an evolving situation. As, uh, as testing becomes ubiquitous, it may be in your own interest and you want to test and be sure that you're okay. Um, when those, uh, but that's, that's far away. Uh, so at this point, we have serological uh, testing is not part of this planning. We, I think self-attestation mechanism is uh, what we are doing and we plan hopefully uh, plan to couple that with the uh, in, in buildings where you have uh, your badge uh, swipe based entry we couple this with uh, the swipe based entry so that if you had uh, if you say you are, you are ill then we can uh, trace back who have you have been in contact with etc based on the swipes but we don't know uh, the extent to which we can do this but uh, we will be collecting the data in the front end to get this going any, any, any additions, Liz? Uh, any question, please feel free to jump in. Uh, that, uh... Okay, so I'm seeing- Go ahead, Ram. Additional, I'm seeing additional questions popping up, so uh, I'm, I'm keeping track of uh, additional things. Okay. Okay, yeah, this, there are some good questions that are coming in live. So we'll, we'll, let's go through these questions and then, uh, is there going to be an online training for people to allow to get back? Uh, I think uh, I mentioned that in the, in the presentation. Yes, we'll have an online safety module that you have to complete uh, as a prerequisite to, uh, to enter. In fact, it will have good uh, safety practices and so on and so forth in, in, the present, in that uh, online training. Yes, answer is yes. Uh, what protection is needed? Is it available? Who will pay for it? Good question. Um, we uh, we uh, have uh, listed face covering uh, as a requirement. Uh, again, as, uh, as researchers, I think we want to be a role model for following uh, safety guidelines based on the science we know uh, for the reasons I mentioned earlier. Uh, and and this, these are the only things that work for lack of a vaccine, for lack of uh, very effective therapeutics that will get us up and running in half an hour, I mean, in a half a day. Uh, I think uh, social distancing, face covering is required. So that's the PPE we are thinking uh, across uh, across the board. But some labs do, uh, for the nature of their work, they actually use N95 masks and so on. So uh, of course, uh, they will have one. Now, one of the things uh, that we are talking about is uh, the practicality of how, uh, so I talked about timeliness. So many institutions have done, uh, that if you have your own personal um, mask, uh, that your cloth mask that you bought online, whatnot, that's a good start to have, uh, to have that at a minimum. And the centralized uh, purchase and distribution of uh, two uh, cloth masks uh, per uh, researcher is uh, contempl being contemplated and worked on. So in that case, you're, that's it, you get two and then you use one while you wash and dry the other and, and so on and you continue to go on. Beyond that, you, it's your responsibility to have your, um, your, uh, your mask. So in that, in that sense, so initially, we, we will try to get the supply as soon as possible. So I mean that, as you know, this is the, uh, the supply uh, of uh, it's a cloth mask, disposable mask, it's not uh, uh, readily available. There's a back order on these. So initially, we would think that the face covering, uh, personal face, uh, face covering that you already have, uh, you know, uh, will be acceptable, but we will give you some specifications in, in, the, in the document. EHS will have some specifications on that. So it's not just any cloth, okay? Um, and uh, who will, uh, is it available? Uh, I think I've answered that. And who will pay for it? Uh, we, are, we are looking at this uh, centrally uh, to do this. 
Uh, any additions to that, Liz? Any okay, thanks. Okay, so let's see. The next question is, uh, what accommodations might we consider for vulnerable individuals? Okay, so this, I'll take a shot at it and Liz, please chime in. Um, we, have, we have talked about this. Uh, I mean, you mentioned this in your, in your uh, uh, kickoff uh, talk that how we dealt with graduate students. No individual should be pressured to come on to grounds uh, uh, if they had health concerns for this initial phase of ramp up. So they're doing carefully to phase, uh, phase to ramp up. Uh, this is uh, the part of PI's planning if they know the vulnerability of their st staff uh, and uh, employees in the lab, uh, and, and then making sure that they're willing and able. Uh, and as we move into later stages, we'll look for ways to help these individuals uh, reintegrate. Um, that's uh, all I have on that. Uh, Liz, uh, your thoughts on that? Uh, it's, a, it's a good and, and kind of complex question. And I, I Rom's referring uh, partly to graduate students. Um, I think the, bro the broader question is the, the normal accommodations that might be provided to someone um, who because of health risk factors um, would need a reasonable accommodation in the workplace. And we have existing policies and processes around such requests. Um, and we're looking closely at them for faculty, staff, and students. Um, and uh, there may be some updated guidance, but the existing process for accommodation, if an individual believes, um, you know, has a health condition that um, means they 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 uh, do not want to be uh, doing the work that they're being asked to do. That's the process that exists now. So I hope that's helpful. I agree with Ram that um, we we do not want anyone to feel pressured to participate. Um, so, okay. thanks, Liz. <clears throat> the next question is uh, uh, it says uh, my question relates to research that is community or home based. Uh, for example, research that involves deploying sensor technology into homes of patients with cancer. Uh, will this be permitted? If so, uh, what are the additional requirements anticipated beyond existing social distancing uh, requirements? Um, I'll provide a general answer, but, but actually the short answer uh, is to work with uh, you know, human subjects uh, experts uh, that, that provide uh, work on uh, IRB and asking uh, research compliance. But generally community and field-based uh, work, uh, uh, we will have specific guidelines. Much of this work will depend on community uh, or area specific rules. I know there, there was a PI that was uh, working on collecting samples from homes, uh, you know, the, the um, um, uh, research that involved collecting samples from homes. So the question was if, if, if the community would leave the sample outside the door in a paper bag and they close the door, I go and collect it, will that be okay? Uh, again, those are one off. And then we just have to uh, make sure that our research compliance uh, officials look at uh, uh, what, is in, uh, what is involved and make uh, recommendations. Yeah, that's, uh, thank you for that question. Uh, in, in the health system, our clinical research personnel are well acquainted uh, with the new guidelines and requirements as part of health systems approach to clinical patient care. Using these health system guidelines, maybe cautiously resume clinical trials, uh, which are currently halted. So in this case, again, under the safety, broader safety guidelines, when we talk about off grounds and human subjects uh, research, it's, it's the participant safety has to be explicitly addressed. Uh, in, 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 as you uh, make this request, as well as safety of the research team members. Uh, you don't know who you're interacting with uh, and, and how that could be addressed and ensuring safety of the researcher and the participant. Um, so the investigators uh, should evaluate the risks involved uh, and, and benefits, risk, do a risk benefit analysis and make uh, reasonable decisions uh, uh, so that uh, you can decide when to start that kind of, uh, that kind of work. Uh, human sub, uh, subjects research IRB, uh, you know, uh, folks will be glad to uh, help you help you with that. How to structure it? Um, our research is heavily dependent on library resources. Many of these are available online, books, articles, databases, but some are not. Particularly periodicals or books not in e form, uh, and that requires. Uh, uh, getting copies and uh, sending it to it to folks. And the, the question is, uh, uh, could we come into the library? Could we allow access to the space for research? 
when will uh, special collections be open? Um, and when will Alderman uh, services resume? Um, so this question um, is something we posed to uh, the, uh, the library. Uh, and uh, Liz, uh, do you wanna address uh, this? Part of the question. Uh, if you'd like, there I have a whole. These are a series of responses from John Unsworth, the dean of yeah. libraries, um, to this this specific question um, about the heavy dependence on library resources. This is what his response was: um, the classics library, which was referenced in that question, is a departmental library, and access to that physical space is um, up to that department in that library. Um, but the library more broadly is doing lots of scanning for research purposes, and that um, stopped and is going to resume soon. Um, he suggests working with your subject liaison. I hope you have one. If you don't, write to John and find out who your subject liaison would be to find materials that are not currently in the library here that you need. Um, if you want me to go on, I can answer a, a series of questions about the library that we had in addition to that, Ram, if that makes sense. If you had anything that you think is significant that the audience should know, please go ahead. Not, the library, I guess probably most important, the library is working on contactless delivery of print materials for the summer as an alternative um, to uh, scanning of all sorts of materials um, and mailing materials. Um, that's in particular for people who might uh, be away or being doing field research where they need um, uh, materials from the library or from special con collections, which is also thinking about this option as well on the same schedule. Um, the Alderman Stacks will not be opening anytime soon. The whole building's closed for reconstruction. Uh, that's the, those are the highlights, and we can follow up with with written responses further. But those were John's the John's highlights. Wonderful, thank you, Liz. Um, the next question is to do with uh, a bit of um, um, financial considerations. So in this case, my funder tells me that uh, um, to, uh, if this is um, field research that uh, people have been paid and, and, uh, and not unable to work, uh, et cetera, saying that my funders are telling me that the practice uh, related to helping offset these costs that impact the overall project cost will depend on what the university practice policy is. We're fully aware of that uh, policy. And they're asking uh, the, the, this, uh, uh, question is, can you provide us general understanding of the approach the university is taking uh, and what information we should be tracking to help inform such costs? This is the, 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 the idea that we are going to be, the university has a poli uh, university policy currently is to pay for people uh, if they cannot be reassigned and finally they are not able to work, they will be paid. Uh, that was the, the original March uh, 17th, uh, I think March 13th message from the president and, and and, the, and uh, as a result, you can continue to charge grants uh, because it's consistent with the university policy. The question is, uh, what is the university policy and can I continue to do that? But this is a complicated question that many, many VPRs are talking about uh, in terms of the, the, uh, the congruence, the congruence between the university policy and what the funding agencies are charging to funding the policy would be. Um, and uh, so this is a very dynamic situation and the agencies also start, uh, continue to give us some, uh, more and more guidelines uh, on more, more clarity on uh, what can be charged, et cetera. So this is a complex question, but I think the current policy, as, as of now, uh, the current policy as it stands, uh, charging to a, a grant, uh, if the agency has said that you can charge if you're consistent with university policy, you should continue to do so. The day we change our policy at the university, then you will not be able to charge, but that's not uh, here yet. Liz, any uh, comments on that? I, uh, everything you said is correct. Thank you, thank you, Liz. Uh, we'll need to develop protocols for disinfecting instrument surfaces. Will we, be, uh, will we need to develop protocols for disinfecting instrument surfaces between bookings of already trained users? Yeah, the trained users uh, versus um, disinfecting, these are two different things. It's, it's the user that before and after will do the cleaning. That seems to be the best practice. Um, again, um, the, if you think about the safety of the person coming into use, you expect that the previous person has cleaned it thoroughly. And when you leave, uh, you, uh, you want to be sure that the next person getting on, uh, because you know where you touched. 
So you want to be sure that you clean up. So that's the best uh, practice. And we're creating an online training that will include uh, that practice. Again, going back to taking responsibility for not for our safety alone, but safety of the others, that should uh, drive that behavior. And, and our training will clarify the, uh, the uh, cleaning um, processes. Uh, will UVA require COVID-19 testing to return to grounds? Um, currently, from a research point of view, for the phases that we are dealing with, no. Uh, at this point, we are not uh, think, uh, talking about every person coming into the lab should be tested. Um, individuals are required to self-attest. That's uh, to the extent that we're doing, uh, doing this right now. And the health system has already in place, and uh, we're going to leverage that, uh, hopefully. Uh, Liz, any comments on that question? Uh... I guess what you've said is accurate uh, as far as we know right now. I mean, that's our current plan. Um, as we think about the fall, we're having lots of conversations about testing, um, uh, sampling, prevalence testing, uh, population testing, uh, serology. Um, and of course, I think all of us who are reading the newspaper and many of you are in these fields are hoping for a great breakthrough here, but um, I would say what we do in the fall uh, when our, our, all of our 25,000 students are back um, is an open question, along with our staff and faculty. But what you described, yes, that's what we're doing now for the research ramp up. Thank you, Liz. The next question is, what is the plan for opening shared lab spaces and facilities? Multiple lab safety, uh, how can multiple labs safely return to a space they share? Um, so this is, they're talking about core facilities um, uh, used to uh, numerous uh, users of, this, of the same instrument with multiple people at multiple times in a day. So if you're talking about shared common areas where you congregate and, and, uh, and work, um, that has to be rearranged so that you don't work there simultaneously if you cannot maintain the social distancing uh, guidelines. So in general, um, if, it's a, if it's a shared common area um, that is assignable for, for congregating and working, that I, under these guidelines will be largely unavailable if you, if you try to follow the guideline in the first play, phase of the plan. The core facility is an important aspect of our ramp up. That's one of the things we're doing in the background, uh, working with the School of Medicine and the college. Uh, and engineering to, to find out what are the core facilities that uh, have, what's the status, and are they up and running? Once the faculty has, uh, the PI has an approved a plan to work, uh, do they have all the resources they need? That's, that's, that's what is uh, keeping us from nailing down a date as long as we have this few of these uh, important cores up and running. Uh, the next, uh, yes, Liz, please. Well, I just one thought. I'm I'm trying to answer questions in the chat. If I if I know the answer, not getting ahead of you, I think in any in any way. Oh, but okay. I think there are a lot of questions about human subject research, and yeah. I'm wondering if you could talk about what what is in the proposed plan related to human subject research. Uh, the current uh, uh, the uh, social sciences, humanities, human subject research current uh, status in our phase one is uh, you can do human subject research as long as you don't have face-to-face uh, -face contact. It's remotely uh, done. Um, and ramping that up to uh, a face-to-face -face, uh, contact is uh, something that has to be done uh, on a case-by-case -case basis, uh, uh, making sure, like I said earlier, the participant um, you know, uh, safety as well as the safety of the researcher and what kind of PPEs they may have to wear in order to do the work. That's, a, that's our compliance folks will be happy to, they are developing, actually they're developing a plan for that as to what those are. And that will be posted in addition, uh, in addition to um, the, the other ramp up uh, processes. And, um, okay. Um, I think, the, yeah, I see the human subjects. Um, I think I stopped you when you were talking about PPE and then there, this last question of, oh, shared, you did do the shared lab space and facilities question. Shared lab space. And then there's, there's, here's an, uh, there's an interesting question. As my lab is already up and running without students uh, and with only key personnel. So in other words, all my personal key, my lab is already running. 
with my current personnel, uh, will my current personnel be subject to safety policies uh, as for new entrants? Um, that's, that's a good question. Um, it, since the safety guideline, for example, we, we talk about uh, when new people come in, uh, I don't know if the, in this lab they required face covering at all times or not. Um, so, uh, so if they did not, the new policy guidance will apply to uh, an existing lab that's operating to make sure that it's compatible. Um, because you can't have one lab that has three people uh, that don't use face coverings uh, and then you, the rest of them coming in wear face covering that defeats the whole purpose. So I think the current uh, lab must submit a plan uh, and, uh, and since you're operating uh, and reevaluate the safety guidelines and be sure that uh, it's reapproved uh, to continue to phase, uh, phase two. And then if you have to add personnel, that's part of the, part of the thing. Even if you don't add personnel, I, I would, uh, I would uh, think that uh, the schools would want to assess that because that could be the uh, you know, weak link that could break. Okay, uh, and let's see, uh, here's uh, questions, more questions coming up. Okay, oh, uh, the, this is a question I'm not, uh, uh, yeah, this, it, keeps coming up, let's, let's uh, do this. How do you define critical uh, research? Now, think, uh, thinking as a PI, uh, the critical research is not always uh, COVID-19 or, or any life-saving research. It's the critical research because everybody's research is important. So when you are working on uh, a technology uh, or, uh, or, or a hypothesis, um, et cetera, in your, a list of things that you have, uh, that you do, uh, you, if you say that th that's what defines your field, that's what defines who you are, and that's critical to you in terms of if you don't pursue that, your career is going to stop where it is, if you can publish in that, et cetera. And critical uh, research is another part where we came across Liz, uh, uh, that this is a fourth year student, PhD student, and there is this last bit that this person has to do, and that's critical, uh, regardless of topic, because it's even you look at the academic pathway for the student. If that is not done, that is uh, uh, you know that stops somebody's uh, pathway to graduation. So uh, so there are. It's not critical. Is not a, a judgment of value. Critical research is in your lab. Uh, you look at uh, you look at all the work that you do. And what is the most critical? The purpose of this critical research, I mean, twofold, like I said, I mean, that's the stay-at-home order allows for that, that's one. That's the bureaucratic reason. But the more important reason is, again, going back to the shared responsibility. If I think that all my research can wait, it's not gonna affect my career, it's not gonna affect uh, the student, they can, come, they can wait two months, uh, that allows for the density management across the board to allow for other, research that uh, that could come in so in that sense be critical of yourself and um, and uh, uh, yeah so be critical of uh, of uh, what it is and see uh, the research that you think you want to, when you when, here is uh, you can ramp up so what ask what part of your portfolio that you want to ramp up that's critical to keep you going maintain your identity and reputation etc so I hope this helps this is not uh, a value judgment based uh, uh, critical uh, research. Uh, and let's uh, talk about, there's a lot of question on uh, uh, clinical uh, human subject uh, question. And this is uh, for, for that um, human subject uh, work. Um, um, <clears throat> Dave Hudson has uh, actually prepared uh, a set of uh, uh, guidance again with a basic uh, premise of protecting both uh, both parties and uh, technicalities on that that is if you already have an established protocol and if you modify that and should that be uh, re should it be run through uh, the process uh, etc these are very technical questions that uh, Dave Hudson in my office can uh, help but he is putting together a plan that will be posted in fact the document will say that see additional document for human subject uh, clinical uh, human subject work so that will be available. Uh, and uh, there is uh, here is here is uh, the question again. Uh, uh, this uh, really shows uh, the absolutely uh, you know we need to do this uh, soon. Uh, where do we submit our plans for our lab? And uh, is where is the website? 
So that's exactly the piece. I mean, the, the last slide that I showed you, the dependencies of getting this up and running as fast as we could. Uh, uh, really, uh, um, uh, people in my office, I'm Cheryl is working on uh, the, the, uh, the website infrastructure and uh, Ron Atkins is helping uh, with it, et cetera. So we're putting together as soon as we can. So we don't have a website to point uh, uh, out yet, but very soon, matter of days, I think we will have something, uh, something going there. Uh, and in the meantime, the, the reason uh, for timeliness is uh, rather than wait for this to be up and running, the, the key uh, uh, guidance document will tell you what the, uh, the safety expectations are. And then you can look at your lab and start uh, planning. So when this is ready, you should be able to upload the information. That's uh, the direction uh, we are going. And let's see. Uh, If preparations and conditions can be met, will this be allowed prior to the governor's lifting of stay at home requirement? Um, like I said, our interpretation, that's the reason that if you have a critical research in your lab that needs to happen, that involves guide students or so on, uh, they, uh, our interpretation, yes, and we're going ahead with uh, doing that initial uh, ramp up. Yes, the answer is yes. Um, and, Okay, can you comment on? Yeah, I understand we don't have an exact date, but how will I know uh, what progress is being made? So uh, I would ask that, uh, I, I'd ask for your patience for, uh, we will provide uh, uh, at least, uh, I mean, ask for your patience. I mean, I don't think we'll have something tomorrow. Tomorrow you will have the document we are talking about, but uh, we will, uh, uh, post on our VPR website um, updates on where we are and uh, and uh, additional, for example, uh, any additional forms that are developed, et cetera, uh, we will be glad to share on a draft form. It, it, so with full understanding that it, this is in progress, but to, to a point that it is close to uh, finishing. So please check our VPR office COVID-19 uh, site for such uh, information. And will we be allowed to use homemade mask or mask brought uh, from home? Um, like I said, our goal is to give you uh, two uh, the cloth masks, uh, but, um, but that's not going to be something that will stop you. That's, if you're not able to come up with it in time and you're all ready and you have a, a homemade mask uh, that, and, and there, we will provide some guidelines on it um, as to what that should look like. Uh, and, you should, yes, the answer would be, that is not going to be stopping, uh, stopping uh, your progress. And um, what, uh, will buses and public transportation be available? Yeah, I, I have to check with the operation. I don't list, would you know? I don't know the answer to that question, but that's something that we will, uh, we will uh, find we'll out. You. We'll get to the answer on that. And then, Ram, I think we have two minutes left. Um, yeah, go ahead, yeah. uh, just, I just want to be clear. You're, you're going to make your slides available and then the full plan tomorrow. Exactly. The, um, and um, it, uh, just two things I'd say, and you should close us out, Ram. Um, we got a very large amount of input, Ram did, um, from the deans, the research deans, lots of PIs, department chairs. Um, but this session, um, was intended to field any question, um, especially to see if um, there's something we're not, we haven't thought about yet that we need to think about. And at least for me, there are several questions that have been raised that I, I haven't yet focused on. I, Ron pro and his shop probably has, but incredibly useful. I think the second reason for this session was um, there was some worry that we weren't paying attention to this. <laughs> um, and uh, we certainly were, but it wasn't maybe that visible. So we wanted to invite everybody and anyone who wanted to join um, and learn where we are. I, I understand we've described where we are without a lot of the documents yet, but that's partly because we've gotten a bunch of input here um, that uh, may help us um, as we refine those documents. Um, but another point was to, to gather the community um, and make sure uh, folks understood this has been a very high priority uh, 
around the clock kind of work, which I know all of you are doing as well, um, or would like to be doing on your research, um, even if you're not able to do it right now, um, to, to get to this point. And um, lots of conversations between and among provosts and A and VPRs and um, that got us to this point. So that was the last thing I wanted to say. And thank you for coming and all of your questions. I tried to answer ones where I knew I could answer pretty accurately, but we will, you'll have to um, await more accurate answers after we can see them all with Ram and his shop. But let me Absolutely. turn it back to you for the last word, Ram. Absolutely, thank you. Uh, thank you, Liz. And, and again, um, as, uh, as we discussed, um, phase one is uh, un underway now and we're uh, working feverishly to get this all up and running. And uh, we could, uh, based on the number of questions, as soon as we announced the town hall, um, the number of questions that came up really uh, told us that you're all anxious, we totally understand. And, uh, and, and uh, we couldn't work any harder uh, and really uh, I'm confident of that. So we will do, continue to do that and get uh, to the end point as quickly as possible. So continue to, uh, if you have questions, as Liz said, again, we are paying enormous attention to this and uh, uh, we, are, we are close. So uh, you please continue to send questions if you have more on this. Uh, and we, we have captured uh, the Q&A questions. Uh, and uh, thank you for submitting all your questions and tuning into, into this uh, town hall. And, uh, and uh, uh, we look forward to working with you and each and every one of you and ramp up research uh, in, in the safe, in a timely, safe and sustainable manner. Okay, thank you.